Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to make a start. I think it's quarter past the hour. Uh, so, uh, with the pop-up theatre in town, the pop-up Shakespeare Theatre in town, I thought it was appropriate to uh, have some reflections on the, the medical mind of Shakespeare, which you may not have thought about before. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Terence Doyle, and uh, my day job is as a working doctor in the hospital, so... I know a bit more about medicine than I do about Shakespeare, so you'll have to uh, bear with me as we go on. Well, uh, let's start off uh, by just putting Shakespeare into a time frame. Uh, the reason is that he relates to various kinds of uh, breakthroughs and discoveries in medicine. Uh, here is uh, his birthday, 1564, he dies in 1616. Um, and he's born <coughs> shortly after Elizabeth is crowned uh, queen. Uh, but importantly, I want to draw attention to the out first outbreak of syphilis, because syphilis is going to uh, loom quite large in the story, the medical story of Shakespeare. So that happened at the siege of Naples in 1492, uh, 1492 first outbreak was in 1494. Uh, the next important landmark is Vesalius, uh, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, which was the first proper anatomy book, and so it marks the uh, beginning of proper academic medicine, really. Then Elizabeth is crowned, uh, then uh, Elizabeth dies, and James <coughs> the Sixth of Scotland comes down, becomes James I of England, uh, and uh, Shakespeare by this stage is uh, a player in London, and his theatre group uh, changed their name to the King's Men uh, in honour of uh, James I and to curry favour, no doubt. Then he dies uh, and then his folio is published in 1623. But it's all before Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood. So uh, uh, Shakespeare's physiology, if you will, is all Galenic. In other words, it's the medieval form of physiology that related to the Greek physician Galen that I will talk about in, in a moment. Well, there are actually uh, quite a number of physicians in Shakespeare, in fact, there are about nine of them in all, uh, but they're not all that important, really, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. There's a doctor in Leah, uh, there are two doctors in Macbeth, there's Cornelius in Cymbeline, uh, there's Ceremon, who's quite um, uh, an important figure. I will refer to Ceremon again a bit later, He's a lord of Ephesus, and he appears in Pericles. Um, and then there is uh, this quite important character here, uh, Gerard de Narbonne. Uh, he was actually an historical figure, but he doesn't appear in the play, All's Well That Ends Well, uh, but his clever daughter, Helena, does. And so she takes the function of a doctor, if you will. She, in fact, is the one that cures the king in All's Well That Ends Well. Um, here is Dr. William Butts, later Sir William Butts, who was a physician of Henry VIII, so he makes an appearance in the last, or one of the last, uh, Shakespearean plays, Henry VIII. And this guy here is Dr. Keyes, uh, Kaios, pronounced Keyes, uh, and he uh, was uh, an important historical figure. He was the physician to uh, Edward VI, uh, Edward the, the uh, to Elizabeth, and uh, to Bloody Mary, uh, but he died just before uh, Shakespeare was born. But he turns up as a uh, caricature, really, in Merry Wives of Windsor. One of the most interesting characters in the medical uh, pantheon for Shakespeare is uh, John Hall, Dr. John Hall, who was uh, his son-in-law, Shakespeare's son-in-law. So he was uh, quite a well-qualified doctor. Uh, he studied at Queen's College in Cambridge, and then he worked in, in Europe, he was in Leyden for a while, he was in Padua. Then he moved to Stratford in 1600 and uh, became friendly with the family, obviously. Then he married uh, uh, Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna, in 1607. And um, so the question always has been, how much did Dr. John Hall, who was uh, really very well qualified in medicine, how much did he influence uh, the players? In fact, uh, Shakespeare had uh, already completed about 20 plays before 1600, and so uh, a good number of the plays were written without the influence of John Hall, his son-in-law, and so I don't really think he was a very strong influence. 
<coughs> one of the most interesting aspects of John Hall is that he wrote a book which was published after his death here called Select Observations on English Bodies. And um, uh, he wrote, uh, it was a case book basically of his interesting cases. And one of the interesting cases is this one here. Mrs. Hall of Stratford, my wife, being miserable, tormented with a colic, was cared for in the following way. And then he describes the various, I won't burden you, because I'm not sure if you had your dinner yet, but um, various things, and gave her two stools, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and then her pain continued to be a little mitigated, and so on. Okay, well, the first uh, real medical uh, person that I'm going to talk about is Helena. And she is the daughter of the physician Gerard de Narbonne. And she is uh, one of the leading characters in All's Well that ends well. Um, this is Helena here. And uh, very briefly, the story is that Helena is the ward of a countess. Uh, and uh, Helena sets her cap to the son of the ward, uh, this uh, fellow here, Bertram. And Bertram is a bit of a wet blanket, frankly. He's a bit of a sock. Uh, but Helena is a real fireball, and she decides that she's going to get her man. And um, the way in which she uh, arranges to get her man is that uh, she negotiates with the king uh, to th that if she can uh, cure his illness, then uh, the king will make Jared, uh, Bertram uh, marry Helena. Now, the question is, what is the illness? Well, it's never directly alluded to, uh, but in fact, I'm almost certain that it's a fistula in ano, like it's an anal abscess. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Um, here is one. You've got to remember that when Shakespeare talks about something, it's always very oblique, and you have to kind of uh, fill in the words. In fact, the Shakespearean audience would have filled in all the words, you know. I don't have to spell it out. So what is it, my good lord, the king anguishes of? A fistula, my lord. I never heard of it before, meaning I've heard of it behind, you know, in the anus, but I've never heard of it before. <laughs> um, so then there are various other clues to it as well. Anyway, all's well that ends well is that Helena gets her man and the, the king's um, anus like his end, is, is fixed. So all's well that ends well, which is great. Uh, now, the, I mentioned Dr. Keyes. Uh, so Keyes was actually a, a quite a well-respected uh, physician. Uh, he was the, one of the founders of uh, Gonville and Keyes College, Cambridge. Uh, and um, so he had actually died. But in The Merry Wives of Windsor, he's caricatured by Dr. Keyes, who was a French uh, physician, and he's always played as a buffoon, a real buffoon. Uh, and of course, there's great fun um, taken by his weird accent. What is you sing? I do not like these toys. Pray you go and fetch me in my closet and boity avert. A box, a cleaner box. Do intend what I speak? And uh, so he's talking to Mistress Quickly, who's a prostitute. Uh, he's trying to get it on with uh, Mistress Quickly, but she's already got a customer in the next room, which is a bit of a problem. I, forsooth, I'll fetch it. Aside, I'm glad he went not in himself. If he had found the young man, he would have been horn mad. So horn mad means that he, he would have had cuckold's horn. That's the, the idea of that, that you know, there was another customer uh, that uh, was waiting in line for Mistress Quickly, and he didn't want to her to see, she didn't want him to see her. Mistress Quickly turns up a bit later. So, Merry Wives of Windsor is a real comedy, obviously, and it's portrayed in different ways, uh, you know, in modern dress, and uh, people have a lot of fun with it. Well, moving on, uh, one of the main things uh, that Shakespeare uh, is very knowledgeable about is mental illness. And so, I'm going to talk a bit about melancholy and uh, its relation to Shakespeare's plays. Uh, so, this is a very well-known engraving by Dürer called Melancholia. It was actually done in 1514, so it's quite old. Uh, but there's quite a bit of evidence that Shakespeare was familiar with this work called Treatise of Melancholy by Timothy Bright, who was a physician at St. Bartholomew's in Hospital in London. And reading the, um, the front page of this book, uh, it really could be a precy of Shakespeare's uh, work in, 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 in mental illness. 
So it treats of melancholy containing the causes thereof and reasons of the strange effects it worketh in our minds and bodies with the physic cure and spiritual consolation of such as have been thereto adjoined and afflicted con conscience. Uh, the difference betwixt it and melancholy with diverse philosophical discourses touching actions uh, and affections of the soul and the spirit and the body. So, I mean, it, that basically is uh, what Shakespeare was writing about. Uh, so, let's look at some of the plays that, that have this. Well, the very first uh, lines in uh, Merchant of Venice, spoken by Antonio here, there's Antonio, whom you'll recognise. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad, how I caught it, found it, came by it, what stuff is made of, whereof it's born, I am to learn. So he's a melancholic, sort of a gloomy sort of character, obviously. I hold the world but as a stage where every man must play a part, and my the sad one, oh dear. So, <laughs> actually, uh, Shylock is actually quite a melancholic character as well, but certainly Antonio is uh, melancholic. Well, in Macbeth, there's a great deal uh, going on, uh, and there are various uh, aspects of mental illness, and... Um, you know, people have written books about um, the mental illness aspects of Macbeth. It's very complicated. The basic idea in Macbeth is that Macbeth, uh, there's Macbeth, uh, has a wife, and the wife is a very ambitious, ruthless, choleric, fiery sort of woman who drives him on to do evil things. And the evil thing that uh, is is to take the throne from King Duncan, who was the king of Scotland. Uh, so in order to get the throne, he has to, Macbeth has to arrange for the killing of Duncan's sons. Uh, um, and the um, killers are employed by uh, Lady Macbeth. And so um, she has blood on her hands for egging him on and employing the killers. So uh, here she is washing her hands of blood which won't come off. Will all great Neptune's oceans wash this blood from my hand, clean from my hand? And then so she is racked by torment and she is involved with sleepwalking. You remember the sleepwalking scenes, I'm sure. Um, and, but she's got this famous line. By the way, I've, I've rather randomly put up some quotes that are quite sort of famous and ones that I happen to like, I have to say, and I'll just put them up the top. I face my fame as a book where men may read strange matters. I mean, you could say that to someone that you work with that you don't particularly <laughs> like, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, and so here is Macbeth uh, down here. And of course, uh, he starts to hallucinate because of the dreadful things that he's done. Is this a dagger which I see before me, or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? Well, uh, the um, uh, medieval medicine, Elizabethan medicine, uh, including Shakespeare, uh, really thought that madness uh, was strongly influenced by the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars and astrology. Uh, and so we have the line, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover and the poet are of imagination all compact. Pretty famous quotation as well from Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, and uh, Othello uh, says he's talking to um, uh, Amelia, and Amelia, uh, who is uh, the wife of Iago, uh, who's uh, a fellow's great nemesis, uh, tells them that a murder has been uh, taken place, and he says, it is the very era of the moon. She comes more nearer earth than she was wont, and makes men mad. A couple of things there. The sun was male, and the moon was female in, um, in uh, Elizabethan and earlier astrology. Now, uh, getting back to uh, melancholy, in Leah, that's yet another uh, very complex uh, play, but there's a, a great deal of melancholy of various sorts here. Uh, so here is the first quote, Oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven, keep me in temper, that's Lear, King Lear. So the basic story in, in Lear is that King Lear, as he gets old, decides he will break up his kingdom into parts. 
to three parts. And he has three daughters, Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia. And you can tell something of their personalities from this. The two ugly ones are Goneril and Regan, and they're baddies. And the beautiful one is the lovely uh, Cordelia, who's a nice person. Um, so uh, Leah asks each of his daughters, uh, you know, do you love me? And so uh, Goneril and Regan say, yes, 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 heaps, wonderful, wonderful, just great. Uh, but then Cordelia, and so he gives them a third of, their king, of his kingdom. Then he uh, asks Cordelia what she, what she, how much she loves him. And she says, I love you, I can't quote it, I love you as much as my duty uh, makes me do, as much as I should. This, he goes into a fury and uh, banishes her from the kingdom along with Gloucester and uh, his sons uh, Edgar, who are sort of loyal retainers of uh, Cordelia, his Cordelia, and they're banished. Uh, so then uh, Leah uh, goes to live with Goneril, who basically pushes him out, and then he goes to live with Regan, and she pushes him out, uh, and then he ends up uh, wandering uh, as a, a frail, old, uh, demented madman on the heath, uh, and um, he's only got his fool, his uh, jester, for company. So that the various aspects of madness are uh, considered there. But actually there are three uh, kind of aspects of madness or melancholy considered in Lear. Uh, there is Lear himself who is uh, perhaps undergoing senile dementia, if you will, um, but of course it's all questionable. Then there is, there's his fool. Now the fool uh, takes quite a number of parts. Uh, he is, uh, first of all, a foil for uh, Lear's madness. Uh, he's in many ways a wise fool, if you will. He comes out with all these really nice quotations. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest. Which is a really nice quote, I like that one. That comes from the fool, you see the jester. Uh, so, and the fool in, in, uh, the, the, at this time was either a professional uh, jester, or sometimes there were people that kind of didn't fit in. Uh, sort of autistic type people perhaps who just, uh, you know, they were just a bit odd and uh, so they could earn their living as being a, a fool, if you will, a jester. Well, there are two kinds. Well then, the third person is Edgar. Uh, now Edgar, uh, you'll remember, was banished with Cordelia uh, out of uh, Leah's court and he's then pursued by his enemies, who are the relatives of Cordelia, of uh, Goneril and Regan, and in order to um, escape them, he uh, makes himself into a madman called Poor Tom. Now, Poor Tom was a, a stock figure of Elizabethan theatre. Uh, he was a madman who was supposed to have come from Bedlam, which was the mental hospital, St Mary's uh, of Bethlehem Hospital in London. And uh, these people uh, roamed the streets and they kind of decorated themselves out as beggars to uh, in, in, evoke sympathy. They cut themselves and stuck things into themselves and painted themselves and so on. So they were well-known sort of stock figures in theatre uh, to gain people's sympathy. And so Edgar says, the country gives me precedent. In other words, I've seen examples of this, of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices and so on. So bedlam appears quite a lot. Uh, in the plans, uh, and uh, in fact, so uh, Bedlam or St Mary's Bethlehem Hospital is actually still going in London. It started off in 1247, uh, but of course it's been shifted uh, with the spread of central London. It's now in uh, Wickham, uh, outskirts of London, but it's still uh, functioning as a mental hospital. Frailty, thy name is woman. Oh, gee, that's a very inflammatory sort of statement to make in the modern day. Anyway, that's what uh, <coughs> Hamlet says. And so Hamlet has got a lot of problems. <laughs> I think it's fair to say he's got a lot of problems. Uh, the first thing is that he's pretty upset <coughs> that his uh, father has been killed, presumably been killed, by this fellow who is the uncle of um, Hamlet. Not only that, but uncle, um, uncle Claudius, uh, has then gone off and married Gertrude, who was the wife of the, uh, the father, the king. 
and she seemed pretty enthusiastic about that as well. So Hamlet is pretty um, unhappy about that as well. So the question is, uh, he calls uh, Hamlet a satyr, you know, a sex fiend, and he kind of hints that she's the same. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity uh, to incestuous sheets. Well, this all really is uh, at least hints of the Oedipus complex, which was first discovered or first uh, described by Sigmund Freud in 1899. Uh, but also, he's got a complex, Hamlet's got a complex relationship with, with uh, his girlfriend, Ophelia. Uh, and eventually they break up, she commits suicide, we'll talk about that a bit later, but he really treats her very badly, get me to a nunnery and I must be cruel to be kind and all this sort of stuff. So he's got a lot of problems, that's for sure, uh, has Hamlet. Well, in order to find what's going on, uh, or whether his, his father was really poisoned by the uncle, uh, Hamlet decides that he will act as a madman to kind of divert attention from himself. That it's maybe more complicated than that. Uh, but his, his mother thinks that he's mad. Mad is the sea and wind when both contend, which is the mightier. Uh, but Hamlet tells us, in fact, uh, as I perchance shall think, uh, it meet to put an antic disposition on it. In other words, uh, you know, he tells us that he's actually just putting it on in order to lull people into a, a sense of, of, of safety. And Polonius, uh, who is uh, one of the, the functionaries of the court, says, though this be madness, yes, there's method in it. He realises that, that Hamlet is putting it on as well. Well, I mentioned syphilis at the very beginning. Syphilis plays quite a big part in many of Shakespeare's plays. And uh, the first one here is Timon of Athens. And Timon uh, is a, a king or a lord in, in, in Athens. Uh, and he... Um, <clears throat> is very generous with his uh, um, entertainment and everyone comes to his house and eats his food and drinks his wine and has a great time. Uh, but he eventually runs out of money and then he asks some of his friends, well, come and help me. And they say, oh, sorry, mate, you know, too bad. Uh, so then he gets really upset about that uh, because he was so nice to these people and now they're turning against him. So he goes off and lives in a cave and he's really uh, very... Um, uh, anti everyone in Athens and he curses them. Uh, consumption so, when hollow bones of man strike their sharp shins and mar men's spurring, crack the lawyer's voice that he may never more false title plead. Down with his nose, and down with a clap, take the bridge quite away, make curled paint ruffians bald. Well, that's all uh, syphilis. Uh, and so <clears throat> here's an example of uh, syphilis. Uh, it can, can classically uh, destroys the bridge of the nose, the nasal bones, and so uh, you get a saddled nose deformity, among other things. Uh, eventually, the, the, the face is eaten away. Um, we don't want to look at that. Um, and here is uh, uh, osteomyelitis, that's bone infection, or, and which it classically goes to the tibia. It's called the saber shin deformity in syphilis. Um, and so that's, he's talking about that, strike their sharp shins, that's what he means by that, the saber shin say about shin deformity um, of osteomyelitis. Myron men spurring. Well, I take that to be plantar fasciitis. Uh, in gonococcal and syphilitic urethritis, you get a secondary arthritis and secondary inflammation of the plantar fascia on the, 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 heat, the calcaneum that's been spurring. Crack the lawyer's voice. That's probably syphilitic laryngitis. Down with the nose, make it flat, and so on, and bald. Um, so uh, the hair falling out is part of syphilis as well. Well, syphilis, uh, as I said, takes a big part in many of Shakespeare's plays, particularly Measure for Measure, to Time of Athens and uh, Troilus. Um, it first appears uh, in the Siege of Naples, and you've, I'm sure you know there's been a lot of discussion about the origin of syphilis. Uh, in 1494, Charles VIII of France laid siege to Naples, the port of Naples in northern Italy. Uh, and um, in whatever way his, his troops... Uh, who were mostly mercenaries, um, were infected with the disease, possibly by sailors uh, who came back from Columbus's discovery of America, infecting the local prostitutes, and then the soldiers went to the prostitutes and got infected. Anyway, after the siege of Naples failed, 
all these mercenaries spread out over Europe very quickly. And so uh, syphilis spread like wildfire. And it was just a dreadful, dreadful disease. Uh, and it just it was very virulent, apparently. And so in London, of course, it was the same. And so in 1603, the brothels were closed. Um, and so he has a quote from uh, Measure for Measure. Um, I have purchased many diseases under her roof. He's talking about one of the local madams. Uh, well, the name syphilis actually comes, unfortunately, from a poem uh, written by this man, Girolamo Frescatore. He was a physician um, and um, uh, a poet as well as a physician. And he wrote uh, a poem called uh, Syphilis, Sive Morbus Gallicus, which means syphilis or the French disease. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was about a shepherd boy who uh, upset Apollo and uh, was afflict, afflicted with this disease as punishment. Um, so that's, that was that. Now, uh, here is measure for measure. Again, more syphilis, unfortunately. How doth my dear morsel thy mistress procureth, uh, procureth uh, she still? Troth, sir, uh, she had eaten up all her beef, and she is herself in the tub. And another quote like that, from the powdering tub of infamy, fetch forth that lazar kite, Dol Tearsheet, she by that. Dol Tearsheet is a prostitute, young prostitute in Henry V and, and Henry VI as well. And a Lazar means a, um, a person with um, leprosy. Anyway, what they're talking about, the tub, is the treatment. Uh, so the person with syphilis was put into a tub that was closed over and it had <clears throat> mercury or a mercury salt, probably cinnabar, which is mercury sulphide. Uh, burnt uh, in, in the bottom of the tub and the fumes of mercury mercury was thought to be therapeutic for syphilis it may have been a bit but the, um, the fumes of, of uh, the mercury sulphide went up and, and the person breathed it and here his clothes are being, uh, being burnt and here are a couple of more so a uh, quote from a fellow why masters have your instruments been in Naples that they speak in the nose thus Instruments, of course, don't mean, well, you know what I mean, um, uh, that you speak in the nose thus means they've had their nose destroyed by having their instruments where they shouldn't have had their instruments. Um, and after this, the vengeance of the whole camp, or rather the Neapolitan bone ache, for that, we think, is the curse depending on those that wore for a placket. A placket is the opening in a woman's dress. <laughs> so um, here are some people with the, um, in the tub. Pour un plaisir, mille douleurs. So, for one pleasure, a thousand sorrows. There's also another quote that you probably know: um, a night time, a night with Mercury, a night with Venus, and a lifetime with Mercury. I think that's the other quote again. Okay, now epilepsy uh, appears in Shakespeare as well. There are three epileptics: there's Julius Caesar, Othello, and Macbeth. So, uh, in Julius Caesar, the epileptic fit is off stage, so we don't, don't actually see it. And he fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. It is very likely he had the falling sickness. So that's the first, that's the origin of the term, the falling sickness. A lot of these um, quotes from Shakespeare, of course, are first. You know, he, he dreamt up the words. He added something like uh, 2,000 words to the English vocabulary. Really, very extraordinary. Uh, you know, he was quite, quite a good writer. Uh, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It was true, this God did shake. Well, the other important uh, epileptic is Othello, and he has a fit on stage. And here he is down here with uh, his nemesis, who is Iago, uh, who's trying to um, poison his mind. The, the, the basic idea of Othello is that Othello is a Moor. He is the mercenary uh, captain of the Venetian forces, uh, and he is married to Desdemona, who is the daughter of uh, one of the leading nobles of, of Venice. Uh, and Iago here uh, has been passed over for the position of first lieutenant by this fellow Cassio. And so he tries to get his revenge by poisoning Othello's mind against his wife Desdemona by suggesting that Desdemona is having an affair with Cassio. That's the general idea. And of course Desdemona doesn't know anything all about all this. And so um, and there's another famous quote uh, she, you know, she doesn't understand why he's being so mean to her 
I understand the fury of your words, but not the words. What a nice quote as well. So my Lord has fallen, fallen into an epilepsy. This is the second fit he had one yesterday. Love him about the temples. No, forbear. The lethargy must have its quiet course. Well, uh, let's move on to another medical uh, topic, uh, that is uh, pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, so here is a, uh, a woman uh, giving birth, uh, and at the same time, of course, uh, the child's horoscope is being read. Very important to read the horoscope at the moment of birth, because that was, of course, determined the child's um, fate. So um, Capulet, who is uh, Juliet's uh, father, uh, and he um, uh, is negotiating with Paris, who is a young man who wants to marry Juliet, and uh, there's uh, negotiations going on. Uh, but Capulet says, My child is yet a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of 14 years. Let two more summers wither in their pride, and we may think her right to be a bride. And Paris is younger than she, a happy mother's maid. And Capulet says, ah, yes, but too, too soon marred are those so well he made. I guess a Shakespearean actor would make more of that than I can do. Uh, like um, you could somehow blur the distinction between married and marred, but I can't quite do it. A horse, a horse, a kingdom for, my, for a horse. Well, that's pretty famous as well. So let's uh, dig into that quote. That comes from Richard III, this fellow here. And um, Richard III is uh, usually portrayed uh, in theatre. Here he is, Anthony Sher. Uh, he's portrayed as a hunchback, cripple, uh, one leg shorter than the other, and uh, a weak, uh, weakling, but a, a, a venomous viper, really. Uh, and so here is a little quote. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, I am determined to be a villain. Well, I'm going to show you a, um, a little video clip uh, of um, Laurence Olivier. But in order to understand it, I'll just, just paint a little bit of background in for you, in case you're not all that up with uh, uh, the War of the Roses. Uh, <clears throat> Richard... Uh, here, this, this fellow here, Richard of York, was uh, the younger son of uh, the Duke of York, uh, and he was the brother of Edward IV. And um, Edward IV, he was the younger brother of Edward IV, Edward IV became the king when the old king died. Uh, and uh, so Richard felt that uh, he had been passed over and he was uh, unhappy about that. Then Edward IV, Richard's brother, died, and Edward IV's young son, who should have become Edward V, was only 12 years old at the time. So Richard had the bright idea that he would become the ward, he would become the, um, the supervisor, if you will. There was a word for it, I can't quite get the word. Eh? That's right. Anyway, so the young king became his ward. Basically, he became the de facto ruler. So all his machinations are to do with how he's going to get to be the king himself. He eventually does get to be the king. And so this is all part of the thing called the War of the Roses. And in the beginning of the quote, uh, in the clip, you'll hear him say, now is the winter of our discontent. And the discontent he's talking about is the fact that he's upset about Edward IV his older brother being king and him not being the king and so on. But now the way is open for him to, uh, to move on. And so now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son. Son there and son there of York. In fact, there are two sons. There's Edward V, there's Richard himself who's a son and so on. <laughs> okay, let's listen to how it should be done. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this sun of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean. Then, now are our crowds bound with victorious weeds, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to melody, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim 
visage wall has moved his wrinkled front. And now, instead of mounting Barbic's deeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in the lady's chamber to the lascivious greeting of a mute. But I, that am not shaped for sporting tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I thought I would. You can watch the rest of it on YouTube. He's just a wonderful actor, um, Once Olivier. I mean, he obviously, he's so evil. He doesn't look of it. <laughs> okay, well, the interesting thing about Richard III was that, uh, so, um, in 1483, he eventually got himself to be crowned king, Richard III. Um, but there was another contender uh, in, uh, in the offing and this was Henry Tudor who became Henry VII the father of Henry VIII and Henry Tudor had been an exile in France he came uh, to England with an army and uh, he felt that he had a good claim to the throne and uh, Richard with his army Richard here with his army met Henry Tudor um, uh, in battle in a village uh, just to the west of uh, Leicester called uh, Bosworth, and here's a picture of it here, there's Les Lester, it's, it's about 15 kilometres uh, outside of Leicester, Bosworth, Bosworth Field, and they fought, and uh, Richard was killed, and uh, uh, he, um, Henry Tudor won the day. So he was killed, um, and uh, his naked body was slung on a horse, taken back to the camp, uh, and then he was buried, uh, and no one quite knew where it was. So in 2012, some archaeologists from the University of Leicester uh, were looking for Greyfriars uh, uh, Chapel, where he was supposedly buried, and under a car park, uh, they discovered a body, and the body turned out to be that of Richard III. And so they reconstructed the body, and he does in fact have a scoliosis like that, uh, but in fact, he wasn't quite, you know, as deformed as, as uh, is made out in the play. He really was a warrior. He had been sent by his father uh, to the north of England uh, to, uh, to um, Henry Neville's uh, castle to learn the arts of being a, a warrior. And he was a well-trained warrior. And he led his own army uh, in the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, he was unhorsed. And that's the origin of this term, you know, this, this thing, um, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. He was knocked off his horse, and he apparently lost his helmet. And that actually is in the play as well. And one of the interesting things is that uh, on the back of his skull, he's got a large part of the back of his skull sliced off, probably by a halberd. This is a halberd, which is a, a, a long pike with a sort of an axe thing on it. Um, and so he lost his helmet, he had the back of his head sliced off, and he was killed. Uh, so, um, you know, there's quite a lot you can read up about that, but there's uh, Laurence Olivier. Okay, now talking about uh, people that are malformed and uh, deformed at birth, um, Henry VIII is quite an interesting character. Um, so, uh, he was uh, married at the age of 18 uh, to Catherine of Aragon. Here's Catherine of Aragon, who was 24 at the time. Uh, so, she then had a stillborn daughter, she, then she had a son who lived for two months, and she had a variety of stillbirths and premature births. This is Catherine of Aragon. Eventually she had Princess Mary, who was supposed to have a large projecting forehead, thin hair and a grating voice, a syphilitic laryngitis and, and hair loss, and then there was another stillborn child. All strongly suggesting that Henry had syphilis. Now there's no absolute evidence of it, but what happened then was that he then took after Anne Boleyn, and here's this quote here, oh beauty, till now I never knew that he's talking about Anne Boleyn. 
Well, Anne Boleyn delivered Elizabeth, that's for sure. But then the next two uh, deliveries were dead, stillbirth. Um, uh, she had a miscarriage. And so uh, then the other interesting thing is Henry's sore leg. Now, Henry had a discharging wound on his leg that was never, never uh, displayed in, um, in, in paintings, but there's a lot of um, documentation about doctors being paid X amounts in the, in the files for, to treat his sore leg. So putting it all together, it seems very likely to me that he had syphilitic osteomyelitis in his leg and uh, syphilis that he infected these women with, because there were basically nine pregnancies and two live births, so those two births were pretty sickly. Okay, well, uh, drugs and herbs play a big part in, in Shakespeare, uh, and so um, in there are two uh, people that uh, deal with drugs in, in Ju Romeo and Juliet. Uh, the first is Friar Lawrence, who uh, gives the sleeping draft to uh, Juliet, uh, but also uh, Romeo buys a sleeping draft or a poison from an apothecary, and here he is here. So uh, Friar Lawrence, who's this fellow up here, says to Juliet, O Mickle, uh, meaning how powerful or how wonderful, O Mickle is the powerful grace that lies in herbs, plants, stones, and their true qualities, for naught so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. Now that's quite an interesting quote because um, I'm going to introduce the idea of Paracelsus to you. Now Paracelsus was a German uh, doctor of sorts, if you will, and he introduced chemical medicine. Chemical medicine. Up until the 1500s, all medicine was based on the humoral theory uh, uh, of the four humours uh, and without the use of drugs at all. But Paracelsus uh, said that that's not the way to go. Uh, all diseases on the earth have been provided with a cure by God. And so there was a certain spiritual element to the whole thing, but he was certainly referring to the use of drugs, particularly mercury. And the apothecary says, put this liquid thing, you will drink it off, and if you have the strength of 20 men, it would dispatch you straight. Romeo is, is paying him. There is thy gold, worse poison to men's souls, during, uh, doing more murders in this loathsome world than these poor compounds. So drugs are pretty important. Uh, this is an art which does mend nature, rather it change, but the art itself is nature. So um, there's more reference to this uh, consideration of uh, Galen's theory of, of humoral medicine and the newly developing Paracelsian theory. And what I'm getting to is that Shakespeare was aware of this. I mean, Shakespeare had no medical training, but he was obviously a very intelligent fellow who knew what was going on and, and kept himself up to uh, you know, recent developments. So here is, um, from All's Well That Ends Well, the foe says they say that miracles are past... Uh, and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and cause less. That's a reference to Paracelsus, the supernatural. Um, Parole says, why it is the rarest argument of wonder that has shot out of our latter times. So it's, the, it's a new uh, scientific theory, and it is so. So I say both of Galen and Paracelsus, of all the learned and authentic fellows, that so this was the new philosophy that was taking over medicine. And here is Paracelsus. There is Galen. I put Aristotle in here because I think there is an oblique reference to Aristotle here in familiar things, supernatural and cause less. So uh, in the early medieval period, Aristotelian theory was uh, an important basis of all science, including medicine. And uh, Aristotle's uh, idea was that everything has a point. Everything has an aim, an end. That's the essence of Aristotle, if you will. Well, that idea was uh, universal in the early medieval period, but it was gradually overtaken uh, as the scientific uh, theories came to, to take effect. Well, there's more poison in, in Hamlet. So uh, Hamlet meets the ghost of his father uh, on the battlements, uh, and the ghost tells him that upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice of cursed Hebanon, in a vial, and in the porches of my ear did pour. That swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigour doth posset and curd and eager droppings into milk, uh, the wholesome blood said of mine. So he's talking about henbane. Henbane is uh, 
you know, it was the uh, poison that Sophocles uh, took, uh, Socrates took, I should say, Socrates, uh, uh, when he was, uh, he committed suicide in prison rather than leave. So um, it's called henbane because it's poisonous to hens. Uh, but the essence of it is hyoscyamus, which is scopolamine. And so taken at large doses, it produces hallucinations and death. Well, uh, Shakespeare um, writes a lot about flowers. And uh, so this is just kind of lead into his use of drugs. And many of his descriptions of, of, of flowers are, I think, really beautiful little um, word paintings, if you will. So here he's talking about um, this um, plant here. This is violet. If music be the food of love, play on. Oh, it came all my year like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour. And here he's talking about violets, uh, daisies. When daisies pied in violet blue, and ladies smocks all silver white, and cuckoo buds of yellow hue do paint the meadows with delight. The kind of nice little, little word paintings, I think. Well, this is a painting by uh, John Everett Millay of uh, Ophelia, you remember who was uh, Hamlet's girlfriend. And um, she goes mad uh, because of the difficulties of their love affair and she commits suicide by drowning herself. And there's, there, there she is uh, drowned in Everett Millet's um, uh, painting. Uh, but it, before she does that, she uh, provides flowers for the various people that uh, have helped her or wronged her. And so she gives Hamlet pansies for thought, rosemary for remembrance, to remember her after she's died, out of the king, whom she doesn't like, uh, fennel for flattery, and columbine for thanklessness, for the queen the same, rue for sorrow, you know, I rue the day that you were born, that's the origin of that, the herb of grace it's called, rue, uh, and daisy, the light of love, and, and neither of them get uh, violets, because that's for faithfulness. Well, moving on, um, the um, the Seven Ages of Man, uh, you've heard of that, I'm sure. Well, that is a long uh, speech in As You Like It, um, describing how uh, the human goes from the infant to the very old person. But here, uh, Shakespeare actually had a very sympathetic view of old age, particularly in his later plays, as he had got, got older himself, I suppose. And one of the uh, most uh, appealing characters is Adam in As You Like It. And here he is, he says, Though I look old, yet I am strong and lusty, for in my youth I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood, uh, nor did not with unbashful forehead woo the means of weakness and debility. Therefore my age is a lusty winter, frosty but kindly, which is kind of nice. All the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. Well, just uh, making a brief return to Hamlet, went not too long there, um, you, you remember what everyone knows is uh, early quote, to be or not to be, that's the question. Uh, what he's saying is, should I commit suicide or should I not commit suicide? That's basically what he's saying. But the end of the, pl of the speech is perhaps the more interesting because um, here he is, he says, conscience makes cowards of us all, but that uh, the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the world and makes us rather bear those ills we have that fly to others that we know not of. In other words, the reason he doesn't commit suicide in the end. He's a coward, basically, but it's because, uh, you know, he's scared of what, uh, he might be going into something worse. Well, again, getting on to death, uh, here is a description of um, a young woman, Doll Tearsheet, and she's a, um, a prostitute, and she has her own unique way of deciding if a body is dead. It's not actually recommended by the medical council, and I think uh, it would be certainly frowned upon. Uh, but the young doll says, I put my hand into the bed. She's talking about the death of Falstaff, this fellow here. Uh, I put my hand into the bed and felt them. They were cold as any stone, and I felt to his knees, and so on upward and upward. <laughs> And all was cold as any stone. So, yes, you'd certainly get struck off if you used that method. <laughs> well, here are, uh, here are just a couple of little vignettes that don't have any logic at all. I just like them, I'm afraid. Uh, so if you want to say to someone, oh, look, uh, if you want to be more poetic about it, what you should say 
the fringed curtains of thine eyes advance and say what thou seest beyond. <laughs> I think you're a loony. Um, mine eyes smell onions. I quite like that one. That's from All's Well It Ends Well. This quote here, now what's in the name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Now that's actually an in-joke. And the reason is that uh, uh, Shakespeare and his um, other actors were... Um, partners in the venture of the Globe Theatre and next door was the rival Rose Theatre and the Rose Theatre had um, famously uh, very bad sanitary arrangements the whole place pond so that's a sort of an end joke that the audience would get uh, if we, that which we call a rose by any other, other name would smell as sweet well I mean, you've probably never thought of blowing your nose as when the bagpipe sings when the bagpipe sings on the nose, uh, this is um, uh, the Merchant of Venice, and uh, the, when the bagpipe sings on the nose, some people can contain the urine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, here's a nice description of um, Juliet, and it's describing <clears throat> the um, sort of the heaving and uh, of desperate sobbing and uh, sort of the convulsions and the heaving of the body. Capulet is talking to, to Juliet. What still in tears evermore showering in one little body thou counterfeitst a bark, sea, a wind, for still thy eyes, which I may call the sea, do ebb and flow with tears. The bark thy body is, sailing in the salt flood, the winds thy sighs, who raging with thy tears, and they with them, without a sudden calm, will overset thy tempest tossed body. You can imagine her whole chest heaving as she sobs her heart out. Well, uh, the next couple of two slides, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the physiology that is in, in Shakespeare. And in order to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about Galen's physiology. So Galen was a uh, first century uh, AD Greek physician who really was the, uh, the father figure of medicine up until the 16th century. Uh, and his system had three main organs of the body, the liver, the brain, and the heart. And the life force was the pneuma, which you could really call the oxygen. If you substitute oxygen, that's more or less what the pneuma was. And there were three main spirits, the animal spirits, which were produced in the brain, the vital spirits, which were produced in the heart, and the natural spirits that were produced in the liver. That's basically it. The liver was the most important part, because the liver was where the blood was formed. And uh, so that theory is the basis of the uh, humoral uh, theory of medicine. And the humoral theory of medicine basically says that there are four elements uh, in the world, earth, air, fire and water. Some of them are hot, some of them are cold, some of them are moist, some of them are dry. Uh, and then there are four main body elements, black bile, which is in the gallbladder, it's a sign of melancholy, yellow bile, which is the sign of cholera, uh, blood, which is uh, sanguine, uh, and phlegm. So, uh, and various people have uh, a predominance of one or other of these humours. So, of some of the characters I've talked about before, Lady Macbeth is certainly a choleric humour. She is a real firebrand, kind of an evil villainess, if you will, and she's choleric. Hamlet is certainly melancholic. Uh, so John Falstaff, I haven't talked about him, but he's a, just a lovely character. He's a big, fat, uh, bumptious uh, ex-soldier, but he loves drinking and whoring, and, and uh, everyone likes him, really. He's certainly phlegmatic. Uh, so, and then Viola in Twelfth Night is a sanguine, sort of optimistic, cheerful, romantic, loving. Uh, but the main uh, organ was the liver, and there are several references to the liver in Shakespeare. How many cowards whose hearts are all as false as stairs of sand wear yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who in would search have livers white as milk. So the idea is that if you didn't have enough blood in your liver, uh, it was white, and you were lily-livered. That's the idea, that's the origin of the term, lily-livered. Thou lily-livered boy, those linen cheeks of thine are counsellors to fear. So uh, you didn't have any courage if you were like that. There's reference to the heart, it's palpitations. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, not for joy, not joy. 
And uh, sir, in my heart, there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Uh, in uh, Comedy of Errors, uh, just give me your hand, let me feel your pulse. And the, the uh, person he's talking to doesn't want to have his pulse felt. Give me, there is my hand, let me feel your, let it feel your ear. <laughs> Well, one of the most intriguing things in Shakespeare's medicine is his mention of the Pia Mater. Now, those of you that are not medical, I'll just briefly tell you that the Pia Mater is one of the three main coverings of the brain, and that's the term we use now. There's the Pia Mater, uh, which in Latin translates as soft mother, uh, arachnoid, which translates to spider, and dura mater, which means tough mother. Um, I won't go too much into that, but the word pia mater is used still in medicine, uh, and it's actually a mistranslation of an Arabic term. Uh, when the Arabic uh, Galenic texts were being translated from um, the original Greek into Arabic and then into Latin, there was a mistranslation, that's the origin of it. Anyway, Shakespeare knows about it, the pia mater, knows what it is. Ideas and apprehensions, motions, revolutions, these are begotten the ventricle of memory, nourished in the womb of Mater, uh, of Pia Mater, and delivered upon the mellow occasion. So he, I think he's, he knows this word Pia Mater means soft mother, basically, and so he's referring to a womb. Uh, now the ventricle of memory, that's another interesting thing. In the medieval period, there were supposed to be three ventricles in the brain. Uh, and here, down below, is a uh, painting by Leonardo da Vinci, or a drawing. And you know that he usually wrote right to left. So what I've done on PowerPoint is just flick the, the image from right to left. So now you can read what he's written. And here it says, imprensiva. That means impressions. So the front ventricle gets impressions. Uh, senso comune, that's common sense. So everything is put together in the middle ventricle. And the last one is memoria. That's what it says down there. So the third ventricle is for memory. So there are two other mem uh, references to the Pia Mater. Well, one of the main uh, diagnostic tests uh, in the Elizabethan period was uh, looking at, at a patient's urine, uroscopy. So Falstaff says, what says the doctor to my water? He says, sir, the water itself was a good, healthy water, but for the party that owed it, uh, he might have had more disease than he knew of. <coughs> so here is a patient uh, taking the sample of the urine. The doctor looks at it very wisely. The doctor actually, while he's looking, or she is looking, I suppose, uh, questions the patient, you know, when did the disease start? How, what are the symptoms? Blah, 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 blah. And so the idea is that you... Um, um, you know, study the urine, but all the time you're asking uh, all the relevant questions so you can build up a clinical picture, so you can give a proper diagnosis. Well, that actually was pointed out in this, this, this document here, this book that was published by Thomas Bryant in uh, 1615, called The Piss Prophet, or Certain Piss Post Lectures. In fact, I've been uh, strongly uh, tempted to call one of my urology colleagues, who's a great friend of mine, a piss prophet, but I don't think he'd actually like that. <laughs> Well, surprisingly, um, this, I found this quote here, strange things have I heard that will to hand, but must be acted ere they may be scanned. And obviously he's, uh, you know, presaging the discovery of the CT scanner. <clears throat> well, plague was an important uh, uh, disease at this time. A plague on both your houses. Uh, so plague uh, was endemic in London from 1590 through 1665, and there were a lot of deaths. And where the a play, a house had plague on it, uh, they had to paint a big cross on the door and paint, Lord have mercy upon us over the door frame. So in Love's Labour's Lost, um, Lord have mercy on those uh, three. They are infected in their hearts and lives. They have the plague in the of your eyes. Malaria, surprisingly, was also quite common in uh, the Elizabethan period, <clears throat> particularly in Norfolk, which is swampy and, and low-lying. Uh, it, it was not called malaria. Malaria in Italian means bad air. That's the origin of it. And the English word is a or ague, and uh, it was thought to be caused by miasma, um, evil fumes. So here is uh, Mistress Quickly. We've met her before. She's a prostitute, a lovely lady, actually. And here's uh, um, Falstaff. Uh, he is so shaped with a burning quotidian tertium that is most lamentable to behold. Well, the significance of all that is that she's misquoting quotidian and tertium. Quotidian means every day, 
so you have a fever every day, and a tertium fever, which is a form of malaria, you have your fever every third day. So she hasn't got, got it right. She says he's got a quotidian tertium, which is sort of all mixed up. Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish agues. Well, uh, the time in England for uh, the onset of the malaria season was the beginning of spring, which is March, and that's the origin of that. The blessed God purge all our infections from our air whilst you do climate here. Well, there's also reference to rheumatics. I'm going to have to speed up because I'm going over time, I have to say. Um, the um, room comes from, rheumatic comes from the Greek word rio, meaning to flow. So the idea was that room or the secretions of the nose flowed and they flowed out to the joints. That was the general idea. But um, <clears throat> so Othello um, asked Desdemona for a loan of a hanky. And she says, well, I've got one here. It's almost clean. You can use it. Uh, I have a salt and sorry room that offends me. Uh, then she means a dripping nose. Uh, but then there's reference to rheumatic diseases. The winds have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs that rheumatic diseases do abound. Well, and the other reference is gout. Now, the word gout comes from the Latin gutta, meaning a drop. So it's the same idea of room, something flowing as a drop into the joints. So a pox of this gout, or a gout of this pox, for the one or the other plays a rogue with my toe. And then there's reference to scrofula, um, the tuberculous uh, cervical lymph node infection. It's called the king's evil. Uh, that's referred to in Macbeth, himself best knows, but strangely visited people all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye, the mere despair of surgery. He cures the hanging a golden stamp about their necks. So basically, people with scrofula, tuberculous uh, infection of the, the, the knees, came to the king, and the king laid on the hands. That was the laying on the hands, great ceremony. Uh, <clears throat> and the patient was given a gold medallion called an angel. And there is an angel from Henry VIII. So it was a very famous ceremony that uh, most medieval uh, physicians did. A couple of references to poultices, which are kind of interesting. In uh, King Lear, uh, um, Gloucester has his eyes unfortunately gouged out uh, but the treatment is uh, go thou I'll fix some flax and white of eggs now white of eggs refers to Ambrose Paré who was the early 16th century uh, surgeon in France who revolutionised the treatment of wounds by using egg white uh, so that's a reference to that I should, and here is um, Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. I shall desire of you more acquaintance, Master Cobweb. Master Cobweb is actually a woman. Uh, if I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. So that means that uh, if he cut himself, he'd put a cobweb on it. And cobwebs have got penicillin in them, and uh, so a penicillium mold. And so it was a folk remedy for wounds. Well, now we get to the, bit, the interesting bit, uh, which is sex, really. Uh, so there's a lot of sex in Shakespeare. And the people came to the Shakespearean theatre not to be morally uplifted, <laughs> to come to have a belly laugh. And so the uh, pit was pretty raucous in the Elizabethan theatre. People kept calling and shouting and uh, egging the, uh, the people on. But uh, he never really talks about sex by itself. Uh, he talks about Congress as execution, horsemanship, groping and so on. The male genitories are referred to obliquely here, the lance, three-inch fool, the dribbling dart of love. The female genitories are referred to quite a lot, but in a very oblique way. And you have to, an Elizabethan audience would know what they were talking about. The lap, the dial, the medlar was a particularly famous one, being the scribe, Pillicock Hill, and nothing surprisingly referred to the uh, female lady bits. So, like, much ado about nothing. Anyway, that, that goes on there. Um, and that's the origin of that. <laughs> yeah, so um, in um, the Comedy of Errors, well, the Comedy of Errors is a real, very complex plot because there are two sets of twins and they, as in most Shakespeare, they get mixed up in a, in a, um, a storm, a sea storm, and so they all get mixed up. Surprisingly, unfortunately, the two sets have got the same name. Uh, Dromio and Antiphilus. Anyway, uh, so there, one of them, Antiphilus, uh, is describing to Dromio uh, a young woman 
that he plans to marry. Uh, in fact, in the, the play, she's very fat, extremely fat. So in this uh, particular version, uh, she's sort of unfat. Um, so Antiphilus says, what's her name? Nell, sir. But her name in three quarters, that's an L in three quarters, will not measure her from hip to hip. Now you have to know what that an L is. An L is an old-fashioned way of measuring cloth. And it's the length of an arm. So you, you take... That's one L, two L's, that's three L's. And of course, Ella Borgen, Borgen is an old, uh, old English term for bow, uh, the bend and the L. Anyway, so she is an L and three quarters across the, the hips. The Maoris would say two X handles across the kumu, I think that's the term. Uh, then bears she some bread, no longer from head to foot than from hip to hip. She is spherical like a globe. I could find out countries of her. In what part of her body stands Ireland? Mary in her buttocks. I found it by the bogs. <laughs> Where stood the Netherlands? <laughs> oh, sir, I did not look so bad. <laughs> Fondly, she saith in Venus and Adonis, I'll be a park and thou shalt be my dear. Feed where thou wilt, on mountain or in dale, graze on my lips, and if those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. The sweet bottom grass and high delightful plain, rousing hillocks and, and can't go on really <laughs> sense. So um, here is Hamlet and um, and uh, Ophelia. Uh, they're having a discussion. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? Remember all these oblique terms for the female uh, lady bits. No, my lord. I mean my head upon your lap. And I, my lord. Do you think I mean country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between the maid's legs. And um, here's Mercutio, who's a, a very bad boy, and he eggs uh, Romeo on by her foot. He's talking about Juliet, straight leg and quivering thigh, and the demeans that lie that uh, their adjacent lie. And there's quite a lot of reference to medlar. Now you have to know what a medlar is. A medlar is a, a kind of apple, and when it ripens. Um, the uh, skin splits open and it sort of opens up and it's kind of soft and moist inside. <laughs> so here is Mercutio with lovely blind love can I tip the mark. Now he will sit under a medlar tree and wish his mistress with that kind of fruit as maids call medlars when they laugh alone. Ooh. And then he also says, oh Romeo, Romeo, that she were an open ass and now a popper in pair. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> One of the more ludicrous characters in Shakespeare is Malvolio in uh, Twelfth Night. He is the steward of Viola. And he intercepts a letter. Uh, he, he, he thinks that Viola is in love with him. Of course, she's not. He's just a repulsive sort of character. But uh, so he opens this letter, which he mistakenly uh, thinks is from her. By my life, this is my lady's hand. These be her very C's, her U's, and her T's. And thus she makes her great P's. <laughs> now I won't explain that, but an Elizabethan audience probably would understand it. And here he is. Uh, you recognise Christopher Fry. And of course he's a ludicrous character with his um, cross-gartered yellow stockings. And here he is, he's trying to invade Mueller's space, pri uh, personal space. <laughs> Well, uh, Shakespeare was buried in Stratford and uh, his birth tomb is a, a pilgrimage site, of course. Uh, and on his uh, gravestone, he's got a poem. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones. So thanks for your attention. I'm sorry for running over time. <laughs>